Well, good afternoon. I'm Scott McGuire, uh, your YP president this year. Um, I work at Green State Credit Union, and today I have the honor of having our speaker, a coworker of mine, uh, with us today. So this is our first ever virtual YP luncheon. Uh, hopefully you were all able to grab uh, some lunch from one of our local restaurants um, or made something nice at home. So um, I'll introduce our speaker today, uh, Zach Walls. Uh, Zach is a, a senator from the Coralville area. Um, he's also the VP of Low and Moderate Income uh, Community Development at Green State Credit Union, Iowa's largest financial institution. Um, Zach and his sister created uh, the Woman Cards. I'm sure he'll tell us a little more about that. He is the author of a best-selling book, My Two Moms. He's a proud Eagle Scout, and uh, he's also a YouTube uh, celebrity uh, with, with his um, testimony before the Iowa House about growing up with lesbian parents. Uh, it was the most watched political video of 2011, watched over 20 million times. So um, I had a little chance to talk with Zach before we started today. I'm very excited for him to tell us a little bit more about himself. Um, give us a little bit of an update uh, on the government piece of, of COVID-19. And then at the end, we'll have some time for question and answer. So please uh, feel free to type in uh, questions and Zach will get to some of those. But uh, without further ado, Zach, thanks for being with us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing your, your speech. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I'm excited to be here and to be helping to kick off the first ever virtual YP luncheon for uh, Dubuque. Uh, this is something that I'm uh, excited about. I've known Barry uh, for well, feels like a very long time, although uh, I'm sure it's not not quite as long. Um, and when he invited me to to be part of the the virtual presentation today, <clears throat> I was very happy to say yes and to be joining all of you. I also was informed shortly before I got on that my wedding planner, who lives in Dubuque, is actually currently on the webinar, and she asked me not to give her a shout out, but I'm going to do it anyway, because Danielle Stoll has been doing a fantastic job helping me and my fiance plan our wedding, and uh, give her two thumbs up if you're looking for somebody to help plan an event. Uh, I know things are obviously a little uh, topsy-turvy right now in the event space, uh, hence the virtual presentation rather than an in-person luncheon, uh, but if and as things get back to normal, uh, I have to give Danielle my, my two thumbs uh, way up. So, uh, I'm very happy to be with you uh, to give you a quick kind of overview of how I'm going to present today, uh, what I'm going to talk about, and then uh, looking forward to taking some of your questions. <clears throat> I'm going to start with just a little bit of background, uh, expounding a little bit on the bio that uh, Scott uh, shared with everybody. Um, that'll probably take 15, 20 minutes, hopefully uh, a little bit in there, talk about kind of my uh, rise to YouTube celebrity after giving that speech to the Iowa legislature how that led me into politics uh, and the work that I'm currently doing with Green State Credit Union when I'm not uh, in the state Senate. Uh, then I'll talk just a little bit about some of the things. I know that there's a lot of uh, kind of questions and some concerns around COVID-19 and, and all the social distancing measures that are currently uh, taking place to try and, and slow the spread of uh, the virus. i talk a little bit about that and just kind of what the experience has been like on the government side as we've been trying to deal uh, with the consequences of, of COVID-19. Uh, and then I'd like to reserve the, the balance of our time to try and answer any questions that folks who are watching at home may have. Uh, I believe there's a little questions box. You can uh, put your questions in there um, and we'll try and, and get as many of those answered as we can. I'm probably gonna try to hold off on answering them until the end of the presentation rather than try to answer them as we go along. Um, however, uh, please feel free throughout the presentation, drop your question in. If it's tied to a specific item, just know what that is. And then when we get to the end, I'll go through and try to answer as many of the questions as we can. And I'll probably try to group them thematically rather than the order in which they come in. But obviously, um, to some extent, it'll be first come, first serve. So uh, with all of that being said, uh, my story starts really with my biological mom, Terry, uh, who grew up in Northeast Iowa. She was uh, a farm kid, uh, born and raised in Clayton County, uh, not too far from Dubuque. And growing up, she always knew that she was a little bit different, but it wasn't until she went to college when she was at Drake uh, and she came came out as a lesbian woman. And, you know, my grandparents, my grandpa John and my grandma Lois, to their credit, uh, did not throw her out of the family or disown her or anything like that. And that might sound like a very low bar these days, but you have to remember the late 1970s uh, were a very different time, obviously, than uh, today. And so my mom, you know, kept stayed involved with the family, kept going home for Christmas and Thanksgiving and all uh, all those holidays. 
And in the uh, late 1980s, she had completed her MD at the University of Iowa Medical School, uh, was practicing medicine in central Wisconsin, and decided that she uh, wanted to have kids. And so I was born uh, in 1991. My younger sister, Zab, was born in 1994. And then in 1995, my mom, Terry, met a very cute nurse named Jackie. Uh, Jackie and Terry shared a lot of the same values and, and life goals and hobbies. And quite frankly, the lesbian dating pool in central Wisconsin was really not that big at that time. So they were very glad to have found each other. Uh, and they wound up having a commitment ceremony in 1996. When I say commitment ceremony, because in 1996, of course, uh, we didn't even have civil unions anywhere in the country, let alone marriage equality. Uh, but that did not stop them from gathering friends and family into a beautiful Unitarian Universalist church in central Wisconsin. They walked down the aisle to the theme song of Star Trek Voyager, uh, which was their favorite TV show in the in the 90s. And uh, I was I was much younger then. I got to be the ring bearer. Uh, my little sister was the flower girl. Uh, it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful moment for for our whole family. And I think in a lot of ways, we really thought that that was kind of our happily ever after moment. We didn't really uh, realize that we still had a lot of trials and tribulations that were are still ahead of us. Uh, in 2000, our family moved back to Iowa, come back for my mom, Terry, to Iowa for my sister, me, and um, for Jackie. And so we moved to Iowa City uh, for two reasons. The first was that my parents, or uh, my mom, Terry, and having gone to school at the University of Iowa, knew that growing up in a kind of non-traditional family would be much easier in Iowa City than in the town of about 18,000 people that we lived in, um, in central Wisconsin. And and she was, I think, largely correct about that. Um, and then second, uh, she had been diagnosed that year with multiple sclerosis, which is a neurological disease that affects the uh, the nervous system as well as uh, the autoimmune system and she knew that having access to the university of iowa hospitals and clinics would be an important part of uh, obtaining kind of ongoing treatment for her multiple sclerosis and so that move in 2000 wound up having a very profound impact on, on all of our lives including mine uh, and we didn't know it at that point but iowa was kind of on the trajectory to become one of the national leaders on an issue that was very important to us as a family which is marriage equality um, fast forward a couple of years, uh, one of the first times where I started to really understand the kind of political element of which our family was a, a part was in 2004, uh, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I was in the eighth grade in 2004. And my very first social studies assignment uh, of that year was to watch the Republican National Convention um, and kind of report back to class. And one of the big kind of hot button issues that year in 2004 was same-sex marriage, which at that point was only legal uh, in the state of Massachusetts, had just been legalized by the Supreme Court, um, but was becoming this very hot button issue across, across the country. And it was for that, while I was kind of participating in that homework assignment where I realized for the first time that I lived and was growing up in a family that was seen in many, many places as being controversial. Um, and that this was like an issue of political importance. Now I had experienced some bullying, you know, not a lot, uh, but some uh, by that point. And to, but I, I, I didn't really have the national context or understand how it fit into the, the bigger picture. And so it was kind of that first experience in, in uh, the eighth grade uh, in junior high where I started to really get an understanding that politics was very interested in me and, and in families like mine. Um, fast forward a few more years, uh, 2009, I was a senior at uh, Iowa City West High School, uh, where we competed against several Dubuque High Schools in, in athletics. Uh, is it Dubuque Senior? Is Hempstead one of the Dubuque schools? I feel like there's a third one uh, that I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but I, I remember competing in, in, in sports in high school, and by the time I was a senior, uh, 2009, uh, spring of that year, in fact, it was April 3rd, 2009, we just celebrated the anniversary about two weeks ago, um, the Iowa Supreme Court ruled unanimously in support of marriage equality, which was a huge deal for my, my family, obviously, um, and for... For me, it, it was really kind of a full circle moment in a lot of ways. Uh, my parents got to get married. Uh, they uh, got married in our, our church here in, in the Iowa City area. 
uh, they walk down the aisle, this time not to the theme song of Star Trek Voyager. Uh, this time, instead of being the, the ring bearer, I got to be the best man. So that was very cool, very full circle moment. And again, we kind of thought to ourselves that this was our, our happily ever after. And yet again, we, we really should have known better and understood that we still had some, some uh, challenges in front of us. One of the things that happened in, as a result of that 2009 Supreme Court decision was that there was a concerted effort to remove from the Iowa Supreme Court through a kind of arcane process that is, is very, very ever rarely used called a retention vote. There was an attempt to remove three of the justices who had ruled in favor of marriage equality. And it was a unanimous decision. It was, it was totally unanimous, 7-0. Uh, but to try and remove the three judges who were on the ballot in 2010, and that actually was successful. It was a very close election, um, but that was meant to be kind of a referendum on, on marriage equality. And in addition to that, uh, this became a very political issue in the state of Iowa. And so even though we still had a Democratic governor and a Democratic-controlled Senate, uh, Republicans did retake the Iowa House of Representatives, and one of their top legislative priorities in the 2011 legislative session was to uh, reverse that Supreme Court decision and to put a constitutional amendment in that would define marriages between between a man and a woman. And by this point, I was a sophomore at the University of Iowa. I was studying civil and environmental engineering, planning to build bridges and help uh, kind of contribute in the renewable energy industry. And by that point, I was I, was, I kind of I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I thought I did anyway. Uh, but then, because of this this legislative push and in January of 2011, there was this proposed um, special hearing, basically a, a very, very unusual uh, public hearing on this proposed constitutional amendment. And I got invited to speak, you know, kind of the call went out statewide for people to come to Des Moines and testify. And, and like that, I was in, invited to come and speak uh, at this, this hearing. Uh, in true college student fashion, I wrote my speech the day before uh, but I got a lot of good in, input. I did not write the speech alone. I had uh, suggestions, edits from uh, friends, from uh, mentors, an ex-girlfriend of mine helped contribute and helped me kind of shake things out. Uh, and I think I, I got the speech into a pretty good spot. And then I, I, you know, drove to Des Moines. And I'll never forget the drive either. It was just beautiful winter night. Uh, and I'll never forget coming around the bend on the interstate and seeing the Golden Dome uh, off in the distance. And it was my first time that I've been back to the Capitol since I was like an elementary school kid. I'm sure some of you probably went on field trips to the, the state house. And I'll never forget the experience of walking in to the Iowa House of Representatives. The chamber was filled with elected officials, with activists, with, with uh, the press, the media. Uh, and it was, it was this electric kind of unpredictable energy. You know, uh, everybody was very, very, uh, kind of on edge, and it was very, uh, it was a very um, charged environment. And I, so I give the short uh, three-minute speech about my experience growing up with my two moms, uh, kind of the, some of the challenges that we faced. But my whole kind of point of the speech was that, you know, we we may be different in some ways, but the things that are most important, the the love and the commitment that define us as a family, that is something that is not unique to to LGBT people or to straight people. That is a universal experience. Uh, and that is something that that we ask not be taken away, uh, that recognition by the state. And you know, ultimately, even though the video of the speech would ultimately be uploaded to YouTube, and as Scott mentioned, might have been viewed many, many times, uh, as, as a practical matter, the speech is actually not successful. The House, uh, my speech did not change any minds. The House, in fact, wound up advancing that legislation. Uh, however, it did not move forward in the Senate. Um, which is where I, I now serve. Uh, and so that was uh, a very um, powerful uh, experience uh, to have the opportunity to speak and then for uh, the video to be uploaded and, and to have that kind of transformation was, was very, uh, it was, I mean, frankly, as a, a sophomore at the University of Iowa, you know, and I love my parents, they both work in medicine, um, when the video started to go viral, going viral means something obviously totally different in a medical context than it did in this political or kind of PR context. I was kind of overwhelmed uh, initially, just not, you know, I'd never, this had never happened to me before. I was just kind of a, a relatively normal guy trying to figure out like how I'm going to get an A in my class. 
Um, and next thing I know, you know, my phone was kind of blowing up, email was blowing up. Um, uh, as Barry always likes uh, to remind me, I, I got invited to be on the Ellen DeGeneres show, which was a, a really incredible uh, and a once in a lifetime experience. And uh, as a result of all of that, I wound up having this platform uh, to be an advocate for other uh, young people who had LGBT parents. Uh, and, and while there certainly are, especially today, I think many, many children who, who are being raised in a non-traditional household who have one or more LGBT parents, uh, it is certainly the case that uh, I'm one of the older uh, folks in that cohort who are kind of on that leading edge. And so uh, it was a, a unique opportunity to try and make sure that as we were having this big national conversation, I mean, remember back in 2011, this is before the Supreme Court had had made their ruling on, on marriage equality or anything like that. So it's still a very contentious issue at that time. Uh, just trying to be an effective advocate and making sure that children were a part of the conversation and that uh, it wasn't just adults talking past each other, that people were actually talking and, and thinking about how how is this going to affect children. And there were a few things that I, I learned during that experience that wound up serving me very well. And one of the most important things is, is very, very simple, um, but a very, very profound, which is that people don't see the world as it is. People see the world as they are. Uh, people read their own experiences, their own histories, their own beliefs onto how they see the world around them. And you have to really understand that in order to be able to be an effective advocate, because if you're not able to meet people where they are uh, and, and to help un try to understand how they're seeing a situation, it's impossible to make your argument effectively. It's impossible to be an effective advocate. So that was something that was really important. And that actually helped lead me to the creation of Scouts for Equality, which was a national campaign that helped lead the fight to end a discrimination against LGBT people in the Boy Scouts. Uh, I'm sure many of you may have heard the news in the last uh, several weeks, uh, months here, that the Boy Scouts are filing for bankruptcy. It's actually something that's totally unrelated to the work uh, that we did. Uh, the reason the Scouts are having some issues financially is related to states, including um, states like Iowa, considering changes to the statutes of limitations around sexual abuse, which is an issue that they grappled with in a really big way in the 70s and 80s, but that having dealt with that, they implemented some really, in fact, impressive procedures that have kind of helped make them the gold standard for present, pre preventing uh, child abuse today in the organization. But now uh, there are, as these statutes of limitations change, uh, a lot of new liability that they're dealing with. Uh, at the local level, however, at least certainly down here in the Southeast Iowa area, and I would expect in the Northeast Iowa area, there aren't any expected changes to the scouting program that will be happening. Uh, and I will say that the values that I learned in scouting wound up being very important to me. And in fact, were uh, how I organized the book that Scott mentioned uh, that I wrote about growing up with my two moms. Uh, the Scout Law, a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And those were the 12 main chapters of the book that I wrote about how I learned those values in the Scouts and at home and how they were kind of mutually reinforced. And so all of that basically helped me kind of learn how to be an advocate and, and how to be an effective spokesman for issues that I really cared about. Uh, and as a result, when the opportunity arose in 2016, tw after the 2016 election, so 2017, 2018, to actually run for office myself, uh, I did feel like I was in a position where I had, I had really developed some un unusual but you know important skills. Uh, I'd gotten some some name awareness, which is an important part of politics. I had gotten that out there. I was in a position to try and, and kind of carry on um, the legacy of the state senator who had been serving in the Senate seat that I now hold for longer than I have been alive. Uh, so uh, that was something that was uh, a, a pretty unique opportunity. Um, we had a very a very crowded primary election. There were four folks who were running. So it was I was not a cakewalk or anything like that. I had to work very hard to win the Democratic nomination. Uh, but then there was in fact not a Republican opponent in the general election. So it was me running against a, a libertarian gentleman. Um, and uh, so I won that election pretty decisively and then began my first term in the Iowa Senate in January of 2019. And uh, here in, in 2020 finishing, uh, or in the, I guess, kind of, kind of in the middle of my second year as a, a state uh, legislator, uh, we're in a very unusual spot right now. And with that, I'll shift gears a little bit here into some of the stuff happening around COVID. Um, you know, if you had told me when I was thinking about running in 2018, 2017, that I'd be dealing with a once in a generation global pandemic uh, in my first term as a legislator, uh, I'm not really sure how I would have reacted. But 
it's been obviously a, a very dramatic uh, change of, of how the legislature operates and as well as kind of the responsibilities on a day-to-day -day level uh, historically, or it's not historically, but in terms of like last year, um, you know, the the legislature operates on a very kind of person to person level. Uh, just before we were getting started, I was chatting with uh, Barry about uh, Senator Carrie Kelker, who I know represents part of the Dubuque area, uh, and who, even though she's a Republican, she and I get along very, very well. Uh, she actually sits like right behind her desk is, is kind of like right behind and to the right of mine. And so she and I uh, both uh, chat, you know, on an almost daily basis and, and work together really well. Um, but now that the legislature has been suspended uh, for 45 days, um, there's very little interaction happening, uh, legislator to legislator. Um, and we're all just kind of in this this very odd, um, I, I say still, a lot of us are still in kind of the response phase where we're working with constituents, many of whom have challenges around, um, you know, trying to get access to state resources, uh, they got questions, trying to figure out, interpret state guidance. And so because we are often the most visible kind of connected member of their community who is a part of state government, they'll often come to us and with the questions that they have. And so we're doing our best to get them connected to resources, get questions answered, working very closely with our staff who are still based in Des Moines and uh, who are now working from home, trying to get uh, questions answered, that sort of thing. And then we're also trying to make sure that we don't lose sight of the issues that we're all working on uh, while we're in this, this really difficult period. Uh, I serve on the uh, Agriculture Committee, the Education Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, which deals with taxes, and the Appropriations Committee, which deals with the budget. And so at this point, you know, I've also been uh, engaged on issues around renewable energy, affordable housing, uh, and things like that. And so during this time, we're trying not to lose sight of the work that we're doing around those areas, uh, because those are obviously all incredibly important priorities. The challenge is that when the legislature does reconvene, and we'll have to reconvene, uh, certainly probably is the latest would be somewhere in July or August, I would expect at this point, because we have to pass a budget to extend government spending going forward. Uh, and there are some really critical policy priorities that have to be dealt with this year. Um, it's, it's what remains to be seen is, you know, how much of that is going to be hammered out beforehand uh, versus, you know, if we're in Des Moines for a couple of weeks um, rather than, you know, a couple of months uh, or even just a couple of days, how is that all going to play out? And and we're at a point right now where, frankly, I think there are probably more questions than answers. Um, and the, the, I, w I got a question right before we started in terms of who gets to make that decision. Is that the governor? Is that the speaker? It's actually a group of legislators called the Legislative Council, which is kind of like a, a mini legislature within the legislature, which is made up of Republicans and Democrats uh, from both the House and the Senate. And that's something that's really uh, uh got the decision-making power to decide when we do and when we do not come back. Um, so that's going to be a big part of the, the uh, next few weeks here is just kind of this wait and see how are things developing. Uh, I'm currently on daily calls and, and, and frankly, probably more deeply connected here at the county level here in Johnson County. Uh, I would expect it's probably the same up in the Dubuque area that your legislators are very connected. I know Lindsey James and Senator Pam Yocum both very, very well. I uh, work very closely with both of them. You've got two terrific legislators uh, in Dubuque. Uh, and so definitely two thumbs up for both of them. Um, I know I was literally just on the phone with Lindsay uh, yesterday and she and I were talking about some of the, uh, the, the bills that we're working on together, the legislative uh, issues specifically around affordable housing. Uh, you might've seen some of the stuff in the paper uh, or on the TV about uh, manufactured housing being a really big issue. Uh, and so, you know, even as the Legislative Council is making their decisions about when we're going to reconvene and what the agenda will look like, uh, legislators like us are certainly still very engaged trying to make sure that we don't let issues fall through the cracks and at the same time trying to answer questions that folks are having as it pertains to uh, anything around um, resources or, or what the state is doing uh, and what people need. I know that there are lots of questions around uh, some of these uh, payroll protection program loans loans that the Iowa Economic Development Authority is making, uh, all that stuff. So uh, th that's kind of what things look like at the state level uh, in terms of the COVID response, in terms of kind of guessing, you know, how much longer things are going to be until we go back to normal. I'd say probably um, two things. The first is, you know, this idea that we're just going to go back to how life was in February sometime soon, as I think it's not very realistic. I think that a lot of the social distancing measures that we're trying to uh, encourage now 
uh, precisely why we're seeing a relatively low uh, infection rate and death rate in the state of Iowa. Uh, we were we were much luckier than states like New York and California. We had a little bit more advanced warning. Uh, so far, uh, you know, uh, certainly knock on wood, it, it seems like we may avoid some of the, the real tragedy that we're seeing in some of these other states. Um, but the reason that that is going to be avoided here is because we've been putting these social distancing measures into effect for a little bit longer. Uh, so as a result, you know, I think it's going to probably be a fair while before we go back to kind of being out in public without wearing masks. Um, handshakes are probably not going to be kosher for, for a while. Uh, I would expect that you're going to see more employers encouraging people who can work from home to work from home, if not every day, then maybe multiple days a week. Uh, I know on the, we were just talking a little bit before the webinar started, on the K-12 side uh, for our public education system, I'll be very surprised if we see schools reconvene this year. Uh, my guess is that uh, even the schools are moving to this online learning. Uh, you're going to see many districts are, are not really going to be interested in, in reconvening just because we know that even though kids aren't at risk for uh, for death and we see, thank God, very low mortality among children, we do know that they are very effective carriers of the disease. Kids don't have great hygiene. Uh, we know that that's part of how the disease spreads. So that's something that I know we are all very, very, very conscientious of. But what you might see on the flip side of that is accelerated deployment of some of these online learning practices, as well as I think it's quite possible school could start back up sometime in August or even late July, to try and make up for some of the time that we'll have lost here in the spring. So uh, that's where things are. Uh, if there are questions, I would for sure be interested in uh, in, in trying to answer uh, some of the questions. And I see uh, that 30 minutes ago, uh, Alan reminded me that Wallert High School is the third, of course, I knew that, uh, but it's been a little bit uh, since I was uh, at that level. So um, a couple of uh, questions. If you want to, I think there's a little chat feature here. If you're at home and you got any questions, uh, I would love to try and answer them as they come in here. Uh, so let's see here. And I, I can't tell if these are going to the, I think they're maybe just going to me. Yeah, okay. So um, a couple of questions are, are trickling in. Um, one from, from Barry, uh, let's see here, I'm sure that when you were advocating for rights for LGBTQ people, you probably felt like politics moves at a snail's pace. Now that you're on the inside, aka a legislator, has your opinion on the process changed? It's a great question. So um, I, don't, I don't think that my view has changed all that much. I think one of the things, uh, one of the things that happened that night after I gave that speech that has always stuck with me was uh, when the hearing was over, I walked back out to my car. It had been snowing. Well, while the hearing was taking place. And so I was wiping the, the snow off the front, kind of the, the um, window shield of my car. And a gentleman in, at the car next to me was doing the same thing as his. And he asked me if I was the kid who had given the speech about having gay parents. And it was, so I said, yes. And he said, it was a great speech. Uh, I work for a Republican who, you know, I know supports you on this issue, um, but, you know, he can't, can't vote for it. And and I said, well, well, why not? I said, well, if he if he did, you know, he'd he'd lose a primary election. And that was one of those things that at that point I was like, well, then if that's the if he's if he who cares if he supports you? Like, you know, he's not willing to go for it. It's kind of what what ha what matters the most is when the chips are down. And one of the things that you know we often hear said about politicians is, you know, they only care about re-election. They only care about re-election. And I think that's very true. I think politicians, people who hold elected office, are very, very focused on re-election. And the reason they're focused on re-election is that their view is, relative to the next alternative, uh, what is your ability, right, to, to make change compared to that other person? And, you know, it's not just LGBT rights, it's everything else, right? It's education, it's workers' rights, it's health care. It's immigration. I mean, there's so many different op options uh, and topics uh, in terms of what people are focused on. And so um, the thing that in order to make change happen at the political level, you've got to make sure that politicians are responding to the incentives. And the number one incentive that they have is you know, the reelection odds. And so if you're going to be talking to talking to elected officials, you know, I would say that probably the two key things are to figure out, you know, what are the political incentives that are kind of resulting in, in the, the politician acting one way or the other. On super controversial issues, LGBT issues are a good example. Abortion is another one. Some of these really controversial cultural issues, 
it's often really hard to move a legislator's mind just because of the fact that the battle lines are kind of drawn on a partisan basis, things are very polarized, and it's hard to get them to move one way or the other. But there are other issues, including this issue that I've been working very closely with Representative James on uh, around affordable housing and mobile homes and, and manufactured housing uh, that are really not political. One way, they're, I mean, they are political, but they're not partisan. They're not Democratic issues or Republican issues. Uh, and so we've been able to actually get some really strong bipartisan support, including with Senator Kerry Kelker, uh, who's a co-sponsor of one of the bills that I was working on in the Senate on this issue. Uh, and so that's been actually really exciting. And but to the to the extent that the question was, has the how, has your view on the process changed? I'd say not really. I mean, the process again was going to continue to be very focused on understanding the incentives that the politicians are under and trying to act to change those incentives. That's what the work of the activist is. Uh, a couple more questions here. Um, bah, 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 bah. What advice do you have for someone thinking about taking a role in politics? The number one single most important thing, if you are interested in getting involved in politics, is to get involved in your community. Uh, you'll have a local uh, central committee, Republicans and Democrats, or if you're a Libertarian or a Green Party, they have local local organizations. And I would definitely encourage you to start local. You know, get involved. Go to city council, uh, county supervisor, school board. There are so many different offices at a local level, uh, and that's where you can make a really big impact if you're just getting started and network with people, reach out to people. Uh, you know, they often say about politics or, or business, it's about who you know. I would actually say it's the other way around. It's about who knows you. That's a really important thing to know is that it's not just a question of who are you or what do you do or who you're networked with, but how are you known and how you perceive in your community. It's really important. Um, what of those books behind you are you reading or would you recommend to a future leader? Uh, that's a great question. Of the books behind me, um, so especially for politics, there's a a book over here called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion by Jonathan Haidt that I strongly recommend. Uh, let's see here, what else? Um, uh, the Two Income Trap by Elizabeth Warren is this orange one right here. Uh, and it's a really interesting book about um, how as the economy changed and women entered the workforce, an unexpected development happened, which was that we actually had more vulnerability for families economically. This is not an argument against women working at all, but it's just examining um, why families that have two incomes are actually sometimes more likely to experience some financial shocks uh, rather than families that have just one source of income, which is very counterintuitive, but uh, that's part of why I like Elizabeth Warren so much is that she's a very, very uh, intelligent and careful thinker. Um, and then another uh let's see here other books that are worth recommending um this is a little off the wall but watchmen is a graphic novel uh that i really really enjoy and i know people think graphic novel and they're like "Ooh, graphic novel it's like for high school kids or whatever uh but very very good book uh very interesting uh and a great work of fiction um ba -ba -ba, a few more so legislator, when someone is wanting to talk to you about a topic they're passionate about, what are the key pieces of information you are looking for from that fantastic question? So um, the most important questions for me as a legislator are, who does this affect, right? Is this, are we talking about, does it just affect a lot of people? Does it affect one person? Um, and I'm absolutely willing to help if it affects one person as if it affects a lot, uh, but understanding the scope of the problem or the, the issue is really, really important. Uh, I also try to understand who has the power in this dynamic, right? So um, if you come to me and you're in a position where you've had a lot of power in this issue and you want more power to fix the issue, I'm certainly willing to listen, but I also am going to want to understand what are the other power dynamics in the issue, who's being affected. Do you, if, do you, if you have a very you know, fancy, well-paid lobbyist, does the person who's on the other side of this issue also have a very fancy, well-paid lobbyist or do they not? Uh, and so not to say that all lobbyists are, are evil or, or anything like that. I don't think that's the case. Um, but one of the things that I've found very quickly is that when lobbyists are presenting their side of the story to you, it's very, very rare that they will ever lie to you outright, but they will for sure tell you their side of the story and they will for sure omit things uh, that are not uh, relevant to their side of the case. So. Uh, that is definitely something that I would I would say is um, something to be aware of. Uh, and then I would say maybe the final piece uh, of the issue is like, how does it impact my constituents specifically? So 
you know, I hear from people all over the state and I certainly prioritize people who live in my community first. That's where my first responsibility is. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm a state senator. So I feel like I really serve at the pleasure of the people of the entire state, not just some of the people in the state. Um, and that's something that uh, is important to me, but having a clear understanding of how this, how is this issue or this, or, or these facts, how are they gonna impact my constituents? That's something that's really important. Um, could I go into a little more detail about my Ellen visit? Do I still keep in touch with her? I do not keep in touch with her very much. Uh, I never like got a chance to email with her or call her directly. Uh, so the way that works is like her producer like called me uh, and at first I was like, well, how did they get my cell phone number? Uh, it turns out they had like literally looked up my, my, my parents in the like online yellow book had called them and my little sister who at that time was a junior in high school and was also home on a snow day was giving them my cell phone number, um, which, you know, obviously in hindsight, good job, but also had to have a talk with her about that a little bit later. Um, so her producer calls me, uh, they say, hey, we'd like to have you on the show. I actually got bumped uh, from the initial that they wanted because they had Clay Matthews on. Uh, Ellen is evidently a big uh, football fan and like is like buddies with Clay Matthews and Aaron Rodgers. I'm a diehard Packers fan, hence the uh, Packers memorabilia in the upper right hand corner there. Uh, so I was thrilled to be bumped for Clay Matthews. Uh, so it almost didn't happen, but then they, they wound up bringing me on uh, a few, like a week and a half later. Uh, fly you out to Los Angeles. Uh, my mom, Terry, got to go with, which was really cool. And um, the one thing I will say is you actually don't get to meet her beforehand. You don't get to have like a private one-on-one -on -one beforehand. Like literally, I'm like walking out onto this stage, the studio filled with like an audience and with cameras, my mom, and like Ellen DeGeneres is sitting there. It's like the first time I'm ever meeting her. So I'm like super nervous. I'm like, if you watch the clip, which I think is on YouTube, it's like my heart's racing, you know. I'll say this about Ellen though. She does a great job. She's a great interviewer, very calming presence, very soothing. Um, you do this thing before the actual interview called a pre-interview where the producer uh, like talks with you and they try to figure out like what's interesting and like what would be good TV and like what do people want to know? And then like they give Ellen like questions like you might see her sometimes she'll have, I don't know if she, she, she has physical questions or if they, just, they brief her ahead of time and there's like a teleprompter and sometimes she follows the script and sometimes she doesn't and mine, she kind of didn't. Uh, so a lot of it, I was answering questions or reacting to stuff that she was saying and the first time I was hearing it. It was very, uh, yeah, it was very, you know, stressful, emotional. I actually think if you give me like five seconds, I think I've got a photo that we took. Um, uh, of course now my, uh, Oh, there we go. Hold on. Give me like 30 seconds here. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was a very cool experience and it was very surreal. I mean, the whole thing was very surreal. Um, and she was, but she was very, very kind, very nice. Yeah. So here's the little photo that we took. Um, I think that was like maybe immediately after like they cut to, to the commercial break. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a really cool thing. Um, okay, a few more questions. Have you read all of the books behind you? I have not read all of the books. I have read most of the books. Also, most of the ones over here are my fiance's and I have read very few of those. Uh, what is your number one recommendation? Um, one of the maybe most important books I read, this is like a kind of, a, this maybe, maybe this will be sounds normal because I work in financial services with Green State Credit Union, but I read a book um, about personal finances that has a very breezy title, but is actually very good financial advice called I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. Uh, and I read that maybe for the first time seven or eight years ago and it helped me start to like think about my own personal finances as an adult for the first time. And that was really, like, really helpful. I don't know if I'd say it's my number one book. Um, buh, buh, buh. I actually don't think I have it up there. I think I might have it in a different room, but Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a very good book. And I think that a lot of people have this idea of that book being very um, like self-helpy or like how to manipulate people. And it's totally the opposite. It's very much about how to be an effective conversationalist and how to like learn from people. Uh, which is like kind of the root of human interaction. So 
uh, Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, will be right up there as well on that personal development side. Um, maybe last question or two here. Um, when the anti-transgender bill was proposed by other Republican senators, were you ever in true fear that it would pass? What was the process like to be able to secure those rights for the trans community? It's a good question. You know, it's it's there were there were actually there was a slew of anti-LGBT issues this year uh, that were proposed, bills that were proposed. None of them survived uh, the first funnel. So the way the legislature works. Um, should have illustrated, you can kind of imagine like a funnel, right? Like a, like a legitimate funnel. Um, we only, so the session only meets for a hundred days. It's in the constitution and you can extend it, but that's like how long your session is a hundred days. So to get all of your work done in a hundred days, you've got to move quickly, right? And so there's this process to funnel out bills. And so there are a series of deadlines called the first funnel, the second funnel, the third funnel. And if a bill is still alive after the first funnel, there's like a decent chance it's going to become law. If a bill has not moved past the first funnel, the odds that it becomes law are very, very, very small. It's not impossible, but I'd say that the odds drop precipitously. Uh, and so the fact that none of those anti-LGBT bills passed the first funnel was a really, really big deal. Uh, and so that was a really, really uh, important uh, step. And so if they had passed the first funnel, I think I would have been much more worried about them becoming law, but they didn't. So uh, I wasn't as worried. Um, if you had to add anything to Iowa, what would it be? Um, hmm. probably, you know, honestly, uh, I think it's really important that Iowa keeps hold of our young people, which is part of why I'm so excited to be a part of this young professional, uh, luncheon. Uh, and the fact that we still have 89 people, I think we maybe peaked at 95 is very good. If we, if Iowa kept 89 out of 95 of all of its young people, we would be in really good shape. Um, I've got a lot of friends from high school who have, you know, moved out of the state. Um, and I think that they're moving to states that tend to be a little bit more, rich in some amenities, you know, uh, things like outdoor recreation, um, bike trails, um, you know, really good schools. I know that those are really important for young people. Iowa still has a lot of really great things going for us, you know, really great cost of living. Uh, my fiance, before she moved to Iowa, lived in New York City. And when she moved, when we moved in together here in Iowa, she tripled her square footage and halved her rent. And that is a true fact. And we live in one of the more like, I don't know, bougie parts of Coralville. So it's a, you know, there's definitely some, there's, there, there's definitely some, she just complained that she doesn't have as access to as high quality museums, which is certainly true. Um, but we certainly have a lot of really good things going for us in terms of quality and life, cost of living. Uh, and so that's, you know, I would just have a lot of really good stuff going for us as well. So, but yeah, we got to keep, we got to keep in more of our young people. That's really important. Uh, and the last question here, what is still at the top of your priority list for the rest of your term? Um, you know, I mentioned this issue around affordable housing, uh, manufactured homes. You know, housing is just such a critical issue for so many people. And actually, um, you can't see the book, but it's down here, uh, Evicted, which is right here. Uh, Evicted was a book that I read um, coming up on almost three years ago about the about housing in America and about some of the issues that people are facing. and for me, it was, a, it was one of those books that was, was kind of like a before and after moment. And so I got really keyed in on the issue of affordable housing, uh, but I never would have guessed that I would be so engaged in on it my first term. Uh, but sometimes you don't really get to pick the issues that you work on in the legislature. Sometimes the issues pick you. And what I mean by that is that almost exactly a year ago, actually, uh, this month, um, a out-of-state investment firm from Utah um, purchased several mobile home parks in my district and jacked up the rent huge double digit increases. Uh, you might have seen some in the paper uh, in North Liberty, which I, is very close to my district, but I don't represent. They saw like a 70% rent increase, West Des Moines, same type of situation. Um, and that really helped people understand, you know, the state of the law as it pertains to affordable housing and manufactured homes, mobile homes, uh, trailers, very, very weak. And so some of these out-of-state uh, investment groups are just taking advantage of some of the weakness in that law and using that to try and prop up um, some of their, their investment profits. And, you know, I, I, I work at a financial institution. I certainly don't begrudge somebody who's, who's trying to, to make money, um, but trying to squeeze blood out of a stone is one, not a very good business model, and two, um, created a huge amount of hardship for people who really don't have a lot of options. I know they're called mobile homes, but the reality is that these homes are very difficult, very expensive to move, if they can be moved at all, 
many homes that have been in place for 20 or more years just simply are not structurally sound enough to be moved at that point. And so uh, we proposed legislation this year to try and strengthen some of those laws and protections. Uh, we were not able to get that done last year. We ran out of time. Those 100 days kind of came to an end. Uh, this year, as I mentioned, we had some really strong bipartisan legislation that I worked on with, with Lindsey James, Senator Yoakum, uh, Senator Kalker, uh, and we weren't able to get it over the finish line before we left, but I'm cautiously hopeful that we may be able to finish it before uh, the, legislature, uh, the legislative session comes to an end, whenever that may be, after we go back to Des Moines and, uh, and knock that out. So that would be probably the number one thing at the top of my priority list, just because of the huge impact that has on so many constituents who I represent, and because it's, uh, it's something that's really personal. And I know that that issue of housing really affects a lot of people, uh, even if you don't live in a mobile home. Uh, the, what's happening in that part of the market is, I would say, a kind of a, a predictor of what's happening in the rest of the market. So uh, just something to keep an eye on. Um, with that, I think I've actually answered all the questions that we had in the chat. So uh, really appreciate everybody who participated in the webinar today, who, who uh, was participating in the, the chat. Um, if you have any other follow-up questions, please do not ever hesitate to send me an email. Uh, that's Zach, Z-A-C-H dot Walls, W-A-H-L-S at Legis, L-E-G-I-S dot Iowa dot gov. Uh, you can also just Google Zach Walls on Google and I'm very easy to find that way. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Zach Walls, uh, fairly prominent. I probably don't tweet quite as much as the president, but I definitely do uh, try to stay involved and engage with people on social media. Uh, and then I have a Facebook page that I like and, and update once in a while. And you can also send it for my newsletter. Uh, I've got a legislative email that I send out every single week uh, with kind of what's happening around the Capitol, what's going on, uh, try to answer questions, uh, provide people with resources. Uh, you can do that on my legislative website. Again, Google's Act Walls. You should be able to find it without too much trouble. Uh, and in terms of winding this down, I don't know if I'm going to kick it back to Scott or Barry, uh, kind of what the kind of closing is here, but I uh, really appreciate all the great questions. I uh, appreciate everybody. The fact that, again, we still got 86 people here, uh, I think it's pretty good. So thank you very much for having me. Hey, thanks, Zach. Uh, Scott here. Just wanted to uh, thank you for your, giving us a little bit of your background uh, and some insight on some of the uh, workings of, of the government with, with COVID-19. It's certainly an interesting time, so uh, we appreciate that. Yeah. Um, a couple quick housekeeping things here. Um, we do have a social media post um, out there for three winners if they post lunch that they purchase from a local restaurant. Uh, so make sure you take a pic of your food and post it up there um, on the social media posting. Um, we also want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, you can find those on the invite for today's uh, call. And uh, hopefully next month we'll be uh, back together, um, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, but again, thank you all for jumping on today. And Zach, thank you very much. We appreciate all your, uh, all your time. It was my absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks again for inviting me, and uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Hey, thanks, everyone. Take care.